do your homework uh, to watch the videos, but I will be showing a few short clips today to help remind you of some of the things that you might have seen or if you didn't get a chance to watch them. Uh, you may have also noticed that New York is not on the continent of Africa, uh, so a bit of a standout <laughs> for the Afropedia series. And the reason I chose New York and Senegal is that I wanted to demonstrate that artists are, of course, citizens of the world. And I think of African artists, especially as not being siloed or confined to the continent, but as living and working in the diaspora all over the world as global Afropolitans. So Africa is not separate and it should be part of our everyday lives all over the world. Further, uh, to me, artists reveal the world to us. So that's something I think about a lot. And, and that revelation becomes that much more poignant and relevant when it's articulated from new homes or new contact zones or in various ways all over the world. So it's a global approach that still necessarily maintains a specificity. So that's important too. I also thought that there was a synergy between those two episodes. So there's a Senegalese photographer living in New York. Um, there's also an intersection of sartorial expression and photography. And that is evident in both of those episodes. And of course, in the work of all three of our guest artists today, Sally Rabi Khan, Alun B, and Omar Victor Job. So I think all of you have also lived elsewhere in the world and have incorporated these multiplicities into your own identity, practice, and worldview. Uh, further, I really think that photography, design, and fashion are all, um, they're some of the most powerful and compelling artistic expressions coming out of the continent today um, and globally. So I think it's especially exciting to have you three here today and to consider the Afropedia series. So with that said, I'd like to introduce uh, the three artists that are here with us today. First, we have Sally Rabi Khan, who is a multidisciplinary Hi. artist. There she is. Hi, uh, filmmaker and fashion designer. Her work deals with themes of the eclectic, the urban. She's definitely focused on uh, Dakar as a city and a space that encourages and influences her work. Uh, the futuristic and the surreal. Uh, next, we have Omar Victor Diop, who's a self-taught photographer. A uh, studio photographer concerned with the diversity of African culture and experience both on the continent and in the diaspora. So again, he's kind of bridging worlds too. And last but not least, Alun B is an artist and architect whose work deals with the themes of intergenerationality, female empowerment, and technology. Uh, he's also a musician and numerous other things, kind of a Renaissance man. So all three of you work in various different genres and modes. So it's especially neat to have you all here. And all three of you, of course, live and work in Dakar and know each other and work in similar modes and have collaborated or shared ideas. So welcome again to the three. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I'm so excited. It's going to be a really um, lively and inspiring conversation. I think all three of you inspire me. So. <laughs> as far as format is concerned, I divided out three themes I saw emerge in the series. Um, and in, in all of your work. And I'll show a few clips relating to each of these followed by a few questions. Uh, then I'd like to finish up with enough time for some audience questions. So first off, uh, and I think probably most importantly, I noticed that there's an intersectionality, um, like a cross pollinating between photography, both fine art and studio and fashion. And I think the, the practices and the audiences necessarily vary but I'm interested in hearing from each of you about the relationship between these genres. But uh, given that, first let's let's look at a few short clips to remind our uh, our audience some of the things that they have seen and that relate to that question. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully technology works for me. Okay. <laughs> I've been working on this portrait series for about a year now. I have around 40 portraits of uh, people that I call samples of this creative generation that, I'm, that I belong to. It's called the Studio of Vanities. I came up with that name because I think for me it sums up the spirit of um, portraiture um, here in West Africa. People always tell me that the, the main thing that makes my work so recognizable is the use of colors and the use of patterns. And then the attitudes, because um, people always pose in very 
official way, people are not really themselves. They're not really smiling, they're not, they're not sad, they're not that serious. We have the feeling that people are posing for eternity and that they want this picture to be shown 200 years away from now. And uh, this is also the tradition we have here when it comes to portrait. You, you call a photographer or you go to a photographer's studio and you take your best outfits and you make yourself look the best you can because you want this picture to remain in the family for the next um, 200 years. And, you know, this is a tradition I'm trying to preserve. I know that there are things I need to express, but I don't know what exactly yet, so I'm exploring all the things that come to me. I try to, you know, build a strong fashion brand from Dakar. I want it to spread throughout Africa, to spread throughout the world. This is, yeah, this is why I'm doing it. I think we will succeed in, you know, making this brand become international. This is really what I want. So I'm going to pause it there uh, on actually a, a photograph that uh, Elune and Selly created together. So I wanted to see some of the work that they've done. Uh, no one else, I think, has really seen that. It's for the exhibition. Uh, so one had an urgent message. <laughs> so. Um, the webinar just officially started. It sounds like we might have been, uh, we might miss a few things. So uh, yeah, <laughs> so thank you for joining. I guess I'll have to reintroduce all three of you. Uh, Omar Victor Diop, the studio photographer, uh, self taught is here. Um, Alun B, also photographer, and Sally Robbie Khan, fashion designer, all three are artists living and working in Dakar. And I'm sorry to those of you that are joining and missed my, my introduction and kind of the reasoning behind this program today, but I'm sure you'll still get plenty out of it. Um, and so you'll notice that Omar and Sally were both in the Afropedia series that we're focusing on today. Uh, but I wanted to also, of course, share some of the work that Alun has created since he's here with us. And um, I wanted to make sure that you all saw some of those things. Uh, so just clicking through a few of these. So you have a sense of that. Are these coming through? Yes. Okay, good. So just uh, some installation shots. You can see some of the series he's created. And all three of our artists have, of course, created other projects since Afropedia. So I hope we have time to get into that today as well. But without further ado, I can actually turn this over more to them with a few questions. You've heard me talk quite enough. Uh, so again, <laughs> I want to think about this intersectionality again, this cross-pollination between fashion design, photography, um, and, and how they vary, the audiences vary, but they still intersect in some ways, at least that's what I, I see in your work. So I wanted to think about um, fashion and fine arts photography and whether or not they intersect. So are they necessarily separate, um, or do you think they, they can or that they should intersect? Uh, maybe Sally can go first. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. It's great to see you all. Uh, great to see you, Victor. It's been ages. I know. And <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Amanda, for making this conversation possible. So uh, regarding the, the intersection of fashion and fine arts photography, I think when I can take my example, when I began fashion, uh, photography was not the first medium uh, I think matter, tailoring, focusing on the collection was the first urge that I had as a brand new fashion designer. But at some point I realized that um, bringing the two together is what makes it possible to create garments that people wear, but to, to uh, infuse um, history, to make the garments became, uh, become some type of archive. And I think that's, that's the main preoccupation that I would have today as a brand is to make sure that uh, the study of the city, the study of the car, uh, reading about the environment I was born in is, in um, I don't know how the, the English word is, but is, is contained into the, inside the garments and that the mm -hmm. garments become something that fix, fixes this history. And 
I think this is one of my main preoccupation and photography is the, you know, the best alter ego to make that possible. Mm -hmm. I think we have a lot of French speaking audience members today too. So I'm sure oh, you, okay. you can <laughs> throw the words in there if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> Bonjour, bonjour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, Alun, did you have anything to add to that or Omar? Yes. Uh, yes, this is Alun. I uh, just wanted to say that, like, yes, I think that um, they are deeply connected. I almost want to say that, like, they are rooted in the same soil because they keep intersecting. They, they feed from, from, from each other. And uh, on a personal level, I know, I mean, I could even say that to both of you, uh, Omar and uh, Sally, I know that like at numerous times, I've been influenced by your work, but in a very like unconscious manner, just like the presence of like just being around it, like had an influence on my take on uh, my approach on uh, as an artist. Mm. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think there are, uh, hi, this is Omar. Um, welcome to this uh, to this uh, chat. I call it a get together. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think, it is. <laughs> yeah, this, both disciplines yeah. are uh, deeply intertwined because um, what we have in common as um, photographers and and fashion designers is that we are witnesses. We um, everything that we put out is a, a sort of testimony to uh, what we have gone through as a human society. It's also a photography, it's a snapshot of where we are right now, but it also is a look at our aspirations, you know, and myself, um, I wanted to become a photographer. I became a photographer because I wanted to be an artist like someone like Alexander McQueen uh, or Silly Rabican. So uh, it, it's important. And I, I think if I had the training she had, uh, I probably would have been a fashion designer. In that sense, photography is a bit more democratic because it's easier to be a self-taught photographer than a fashion than a self than a self-taught fashion designer. Uh, so yeah, for me, it's almost the same discipline. That yeah, that makes me wonder, um, Sally, are are you self-taught? I, I got the impression from the the Afropedia that you were, but um, could you talk a bit more about yeah. the training you might have gotten? Yeah, I'm. I'm almost self-taught. Let's say that I, I did a fashion and business school. So I didn't go to a style, Nicole de Style, as, as we say it in, uh, in, uh, in French. So I'm, I'm not self-taught in the business of fashion, but regarding uh, everything that I have, creative skills, I learned it before going to fashion school, drawing. I started uh, dressing my dolls way before I sat in a fashion school. So it's uh, Victor. It's you can do your fashion line whenever you feel like it, and I'm sure you're gonna <laughs> drop, you're gonna drop something on us like a bomb. <laughs> Don't tempt well, me. <laughs> I I would love to see that. Um, so I think another thing that came out of those clips is that idea of branding, and and definitely in in all of your work there there's a certain um, essence to it that is recognizable. So. I wanted to ask you, um, do you find that branding is something that you do um, consciously as, as artists or as photographers or as fashion designers? Uh, Alun. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Branding is, uh, is at the, almost at the core of what we do because beyond everything, we are entrepreneur. But I want to say also that like at the core of our message, we're trying to um, redefine or at least give um, a, a more authentic view of like what is Africa to us, at least our Africa. And uh, when I think of that, the first thing that comes to mind is what we have to show to the world, that product that we want to put on a shelf, we are proud of it. So, and it's a gift too, you know, it's like here, here who we are and that gift better be well wrapped you know the wrapped is important mm -hmm. so so that people will be like you know curious about like what's inside of it and i think that's the problem is that people usually like stay on the surface they will see like you know cliche uh, images of africa and they would like just like live with that and be like all right this is africa so you know surprise them with like 
a beautiful package so they could act, finally like get to see what's inside, you know, like dig deeper. Yeah, I think all three of you are definitely articulating your version of Africa and, and Dakar <laughs> specifically, uh, or West Africa as well. And you're articulating that message in a really interesting way. And all three of you uh, are thinking very positively about the future and, and representing that in the present and articulating again that message to push people a little bit further to kind of broaden what they think of um, an African experience to be. Um, so uh, Omar, did you want to comment on, on branding? <laughs> yeah, yeah, th there is a, a, a great um, branding element to whatever we put out. Because uh, when you look at, I mean, we're visual artists, so um, even even Selly, mostly Selly actually, we are, um, we have competition. Our competition is the stereotypes, the, the zebras and giraffes and mm -hmm. everything that goes south in, on this continent, Wakanda and all these things, which are, <laughs> you know, um, this is not our reality, you know, it's, a, it's an interpretation of uh, the African experience or the African future, it's fine. But every pair of eye that we catch at any time of the day has seen hundreds of other images. And many of which are um, images of Africa that are not the reality that we want to share. So you need to have your visual signature. You need to have your branding right. I was born on social media. I was born on Facebook. You know, Facebook told me that I was a photographer. I didn't know. So, uh, of course, I learned from that and I learned from my background in the corporate world. You need a brand, but keep it honest and keep it authentic. You know, you're not selling a product. You, you're sharing a reality. Love that. Kelly? Yes. Uh, I think branding started when uh, I created the brand very organically. I started to, interestingly, I started branding for fashion, doing visual arts, doing for collages, doing shoot photo shoots, and uh, just pushing the visual envelope and uh, integrating all the influences that I had from watching uh, Duril Joman Betty, from watching, uh, from listening to many uh, tales, urban legends, from fantastic cinema all around the world. So I think there was a moment where I needed to make the synthesis of all the images I have absorbed and to make sure that that absorption is linked with the fashion product that I was uh, putting out. So I, I think very, very early that the, the fantasy world, the, the need, some type of urge for speculation was infused into the brand. And it started as something quite like a research and at some point it just became the DNA of the, the brand because the core of what I want to share with the world is the blend between immaterial patrimony, uh, urban Dakar, uh, a curiosity for, for history, for heritage. Donc, uh, yeah, it's, it's important to make sure that when um, you want to share who you are, that you do it with the tools that suit you the best. Mm -hmm. And as Victor said, that do it to do it truthfully and authentically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So uh, I think I'm going to ask one quick question to Sally and Alun, and then I'll move into the next um, kind of set of thematic questions. Um, and and because I, I showed that photograph recently at the end of the first clips, I wanted to ask Sally and Alun um, about that collaboration. You recently collaborated to create this sort of blended fashion fine art photo um, with a, an on, ensemble that is meant to be part of a museum exhibition. So I wanted to know how conducting a photography shoot like that differed or may have differed from studio or a, a straight fashion um, experience. So it was a different location and, uh, you know, instruction to the model, lighting, audience. So, so how did that project kind of, what? What instructions did you get from it, or what did you? What impression did you get from doing that? Um, yes. Yeah, so ahead. I say the process. The process was uh, was interesting for me. You know, I'm I'm a maximalist at heart. Le uh, more is always more. And then I had uh, the conversation. The conversation with uh, Anun B was interesting because he. He made me see the, the project we were working on as something that uh, wasn't necessarily going to be served by the objects that we were adding on the, on the model, but 
by the, the space that we were living in. And that space is exactly what creates the feel. That's where the, your message and where the, um, the reminiscence is actually. And the, the fact that I came from uh, a space of creating saturated universe and him, he came from a, a quelque chose de plus dépouillé. I think it was it was an interesting an interesting conversation. And um, what what I what I took out of the experience is that uh, telling a story that the void and emptiness tells as well a story as as uh, beautifully as you know maximalism can can tell stories. So that's that's what I took out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, I love the fact that you use the word uh, reminisce because uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, the key word, at least for me, was memories. We had to tap into, um, like, we had to go beyond the beauty on the surface, uh, mm -hmm. which, which, is, um, which is, again, like, you know, going back to the previous question about branding, you know, we need that beauty because beauty attracts. But then once you, you know, the, once you, you have like the attention, what do you show, you know, how deep, how deep the roots goes, like sink in the soil. And, um, and so to me, uh, location was key. We actually, me and Sally, we went on location and we actually found this like place that was about to be uh, gentrified. Uh, and so they, they removed the people from that place, but they were still like, pieces from the past in those houses where we actually shot that. And it was just so many memories just beyond the walls. I mean, there was just lots of objects all over the place. And, uh, and I remember mm -hmm. that when, as we worked uh, and, and um, Sally was really like, you know, uh, staging the, our, our model into, into the, the, the mood of the, of the shoot, we started like tapping into memories, tap, tapping into our, our imagination and trying to like, I remember like telling her, we were telling her to like think of her past, her, her, oh. her family that like once lived there, even though she didn't live in that place. And she kind of like played that game with us and she could um, uh, uh, resonate with that, uh, with that memory. And I think that brought a lot of authenticity to the, to the shoot. And I think at the end of the day, it goes back to that, you know, people will feel if it's true or if, or if it's not true, what you're trying, what you're trying to con convey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, and the, and the reason I asked about that is because it's the last thing. So it'll be the first image that we see again when I share the screen <laughs> for this next bit. Um, so, so I want to think about another theme that I saw emerge um, during these episodes and in all of your work. And that's... Um, and it's also something I think characterizes this new younger generation that um, they certainly are aware of the past, but not necessarily subject to the dismemberings of it. They're sort of um, thinking very positively and optimistically moving towards um, a future with respect to a present, being responsible in, in the present. So um, all three of you have been taking risks. You're brave, you've been courageous. And I think that's something that definitely came out in the series and, and from what I know of you and your work. So um, Risk and Courage is our next theme, and I want to show a few clips from that and get to it. So there's that image again, and you can see the space that they were just speaking about. And yes, I think it's one of the strongest memories to realize that you just have to express things and, and take the risk. It's not just about fashion, it's about art, it's about expression. So people need to feel it and people need to enter your universe. And this is a really important thing to me. I think the most important media is social media. If it wasn't for, I guess, that Facebook page, I never would have believed in myself enough to say I'm a photographer is because I had constant feedback from thousands of people I don't even know. But I think for the next generation in 21st century, what is very interesting is like how you can actually help people to believe in themselves. Much more than just create art only, it's like how you can actually make them starting the journey that they need to start for themselves. 
to believe in themselves and to risk something, even if they're going to lose something. Okay. So, um, again, all three of you kind of merge these concepts of fashion, art, photography, uh, to varying degrees, music. I know at least two of you play music. Omar, I'm not sure if you do or not, but um, <laughs> so you're sliding in and out of these modes and these genres, right? So do you find that the risk is greater in one realm over another uh, or in confining or being confined to one genre over another? Because I, I know at least Alun, um, probably all of you don't want to be confined in one specific genre where you're not really allowed to make art in other modes besides photography, for example. So, so I guess I want to lie, um, ask if, if you're the strength of your work lies in one particular medium or in pluralizing that? And what risk might you have taken in choosing one mode over another? Uh, let's go with Omar. <laughs> well, um, as far as I'm concerned, um, that is not the, the critical question. The question is, which best way can I, uh, can I share my ideas? You know, some ideas uh, are more suitable for writing. Some ideas are, uh, I mean, for some ideas, writing is more suitable. For some others, you need a moving image or you need uh, photography. Um, so it, it's the other way around um, as, far, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but I sometimes uh, have to make a choice. Like for instance, uh, every portrait that I shoot, I actually write it down first. Like I, there is a monologue. I have like, I could mm. actually put a book out with uh, a text for every single image. It's, it, it probably will happen one day, but um, I understand that right now we are in a sort of visual um, era. People need images. People need images travel much faster. They go much further. They're easier to remember. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess if it was in the 1920s, I would have had to put out a book, you know, and, <laughs> you know, so uh, sometimes you have to make choices um, and sometimes it can be complicated. Like, oh, I really like this text, but hey, let me start with the image and maybe in a couple of years, uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll publish something. Uh, Alun or Sally, do you have any thoughts on a, a riskier genre over another or not? Yes, um, as far as I'm concerned, I think it, it um, has always been a way to be, I mean, exploring several other types of uh, artistic expressions, uh, film, uh, installation, all of that has from the beginning uh, fed fashion and the fact that when I came back to Dakar I was straight into a, an art collective I think it's it's a, it's part of it and that's why it's part as well of the DNA of the brand to collaborate constantly and to just um, make sure that once when something happens for fashion all of the uh, music uh, photography film all of those genres are convoked to make sure that the the, the message that I want to infuse into the garment is loud enough, uh, visual enough and immersive enough. And I, I think it's, uh, I, I, I don't see it another way actually. I think it became quite organic and even it's, it's a characteristic of the era we are living in right now to just to be multi-talented because the tools, the technology, the the mindset permits it so yeah to me it's it's as natural to be a fashion designer to make vr to write it's about it's just part of it yeah i i feel like that that is one of the things that differs a bit in this generation i think you're really you're hitting on that because um some of the older generations of artists were were almost branded in a way where they needed to be known for a particular kind of art and stay in that lane sure. Uh, and I think it definitely is changing now to where you, you're all exploring in so many interesting ways and seeing those, those genres and those messages intertwining um, and reaching mm -hmm. greater audiences through that multiplicitous, multiplicitous nature of it. Um, Alun, and I, I know you also are, are hoping to kind of break out of, of you know, strict photography and thinking about AR and VR and installations and things like that. So do you want to offer uh, any thoughts? Absolutely, and especially going back to that question about like, you know, if, you, if, you, if we think that the risk is greater, I actually don't think that the risk is greater, but I, I, I think that like, 
it, it's great to take a risk, you know? And um, I, uh, even looking back, I know that like, uh, after like studying abroad, like uh, a lot of like, you know, my fellow artists here, um, going back to Senegal, I was always like, often like confronted with people telling me, like trying to work with people and they would tell me like, hey, wake up, this is Africa, you know, this is not possible, you know, you're not in the West, you know, like your ideas are like far too like, you know, stretched out. But then, um, and it was when I actually saw like, you know, uh, documentaries like the Africopedia and, and then I see like the work of um, those artists and they're taking risks, you know, and that's when it, like I realized that like, uh, we're not, at least back then, it changed now, but we're not a lot that have like new things to put on the table but we are willing to take that risk. And, um, and to sort of like touch on rapidly, briefly on um, uh, just uh, exploring like new uh, avenues, I think that we are submerged with information. There's way too much info out there and people are just looking for that uh, info that, that's, dif that's different, you know, something that's niche and uh, like, that's innovating and innovation only happens when world realms collide. Um, I think of like Omar, for instance, uh, I think I was with you, Amanda, we went to his place. Uh, he designed a house, like a true architect. He worked with a, an architect, but like you could tell that there was a dialogue, there was a conversation, there was a whole concept behind it. It was just not a building, it was a building with a soul. And uh, so to me, uh, like Omar is an architect, Silly is a, a filmmaker, in, and I think the more we actually explore on those like different journeys, the more we enrich our own journey as in like what we want to do. Yeah, they're all connected. Going back to your first question, the, the, the art speaks to each other. It's mm -hmm. one family, same tree. <laughs> <laughs> we actually had an audience question that um, maybe one of you can elaborate on uh, because it relates to what we're talking about. So he, he says, Raymond, uh, to all, do you think you have to take more risks or less risks than artists in the past? Oh. So I don't know. <laughs> well, um, it's, it's not like we have to take more risks. Art is, art is risky because you're pouring your, your heart out. It's, more, it's even riskier now because uh, uh, when it hits back, it hits back much, fast, much faster and much harder. Uh, so, um, so I guess that's, that's the risky element, the, the increased risky element uh, in being an artist right now. Uh, I don't know what you guys think. No, I, I agree. So, like, I was just going to say the risk is this, it's like everything's live nowadays. So like, I know. you cannot sleep, <laughs> you know, this is it. Like, you know, it's like a live soccer game. If you miss that penalty kick, you know, they're going to, they're going to get you at the end of the game, you know, yeah. so. <laughs> There's a lot of risk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see, I think we have a few other questions coming in. So I still wanna leave some time um, and I wanna show the third set. So let's move on to the last kind of topic I've been thinking about or that I noticed that you all think uh, very poignantly about, um, which is the future and the city itself and how global conversations like you've all been mentioning like the one we're having right now, um, are becoming more and more critical and, and just happening so fast and all the time and really um, creating and coloring our world, um, amplifying it in so many ways. So I wanted to show a few clips about the, that topic, the last set of clips I'll show you all. Simply using the word Africa is loaded. People have so many ideas of what Africa is. This house is very powerful and uh, strong of many, many energy and many wills to change the city and to make people see the city how it really is. I see the culture that surrounds us in that alternative scene. I see that culture as a photography of a super huge movement that is taking form, but we don't see the big picture now because we are so involved in it. And, um, and culture is, is essential today. It's super important for people like us to express ourselves and to be able to live 
from that expression. This is our world. This is our alternative and this is we giving the image that needs to be seen of our country far from the politics that are doing God know what. Moi, ce qui me choquera toujours, c'est quand je suis revenue au Sénégal en 2010, on m'a demandé pourquoi, pourquoi je ne suis pas restée en France, pourquoi je suis rentrée ici, parce qu'il n'y avait rien à faire ici. Et pour moi, Omar, Victor Diop, Rodia et Célie Rabican, notamment, il y en a beaucoup d'autres, sont des gens qui ont compris ça, qu'il fallait revenir au Sénégal et investir ici et développer euh, selon, le secte, selon leur secteur d'activité, quelque chose. Parce que tout reste à faire ici et si ce n'est pas nous qui le faisons, qui va le faire quoi. On ne va pas attendre encore 50 ans ou 100 ans <rire> pour changer les choses. On n'a plus de temps à perdre quoi. All of these people that need an outlet to express or to show what it is that they're doing have found a place in another Africa. But it's about having an audience that wants or even has the capacity to believe that something other than war and strife and problems exists. We have contributors all over the world. It's just really collapsed this idea of distance and this idea of, of conversation being possible with people anywhere on the planet. It's like being a media channel makes the internet powerful is that it has the opportunity to bring democracy. People are finally getting to the place where they are hungry for this type of coverage. That means that we're making a difference and showing how creativity really has the power to influence So I think the, the last artist and also Sally really talked about um, creativity and culture as being essential uh, and, and is something that we, we need right now. And, and especially, you know, that was a few years ago, even especially now in COVID-19, mm -hmm. like we, we need art, we need culture, we need all of you to help guide us through this, this really intense time, right? And as all of you have been saying, and, and just in those clips, like we're also connected um, at a breathless pace in some ways. So um, I've been thinking a lot about that and how important conversations like this are and, and your um, artworks are to all of us to just get us through all of this and to think about our positionality um, in the present in so many different ways, especially with how scary things are right now. And then what we need to do to, to create our future, the, the, a brighter one, one that we can all be a part of and proud of in a lot of ways. So um, I guess my, my last set of questions are, are related to that those ideas about the future um, and, and also the city itself. So, but first off, I wanna back up a little and since this has been a few years since this was filmed, uh, all of you have been doing so much since then, you've created a lot of amazing things. So um, how has your work changed since this series was created? And Alun, I know it inspired you to move back as was mentioned in those clips and you mentioned. So what have each of you been doing over the last few years and how uh, might this, Series or other works inspired you. Uh, dealer's choice. Um, well, for, for me, it's very particular because um, uh, I came back to Dakar on uh, on March ninth um, from Paris, and uh, actually I was uh, I had spent a week in Paris because I had a meeting with uh, my gallery. It was like the unveiling of uh, the new project, which was about the future. Uh, because, uh, you know, I, um, my last previous, uh, my, my two previous um, series were Diaspora, which was about uh, the legacy of, you know, Africans uh, shining uh, across the world from the 15th to the 19th century. And uh, then I did Lib Liberty, which was uh, sort of the same work, but uh, focusing on um, you know the history of black protests uh, across the world and then I wanted to do the last part which was about the future and uh, the project was almost completed and uh, it had a very um, uh, dystopian aspect you know uh, a lot to do with uh, environment and living together connecting for real and then I was somehow uh, um, what's the word um, uh, par la, par la how would you say that you guys help me out you from reality. 
yeah, like caught by like reality caught up to this project. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I put it back in the studio. I'm cooking it again and uh, uh, it's going to be interesting. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> forward, I hope so. Sally <laughs> or yeah, okay. Uh, yes, since the Afropedia series, I think it, uh, it was shot in 2014, if I'm not mistaken. And that's when we, we did the Alien Cartoon Collection that was a very important moment in my creative journey because that's when I think everything was released, expressed, all the, um, the creative weirdness was shown to the world. But let's say since since that moment, it was um, I think Alien Cartoon was a moment where we created an immersive world, where we created some decorum, where we wrote a story, and showing that at that moment made me um, start exploring film, start exploring design, start exploring uh, uh, storytelling in many other fields. So I think. Since then, what happened is that that type of hyperactivity and multidisciplinary, uh, multi, multidisciplinarity um, was uh, really pushed until today when I know that uh, fashion and film and writing are as important to, to me as uh, making garments. Can I jump in real quick uh, about Alien Cartoon? Silly, yeah. this was the moment where you really, really uh, allowed us to enter your universe because we could like, uh, you know, uh, look at, look in from the window and we love what we saw, but we could never walk in. But Alien Cartoon, <laughs> uh, it's when you really, really opened the doors. And I remember uh, it was mm -hmm. at a railway station and there was a sort of um, moment happening and you were at the core of it. There was a fashion show, installations and, and everything. And yeah. I remember walking out of that and like, wow, this girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Respect. I remember. As yeah. A... Thank you guys. <laughs> Legendary. Yeah. Now I miss. I really miss doing fashion shows like that. But you know, at the same time, I'm. I'm wondering. I mean, a bit of a conflict. Is it reasonable to put to put that much money into an event today? Is it you know? And mm. that's that's. Um, I mean, I think that that's what the crisis is uh, infusing into us as a brand. You know, we, we need to know where we put money. We need to know that uh, when you put that much money in a show, well, maybe you can do it in another way. So it's mm. it's what we're exploring right now. But Alien Cartoon mm. was definitely an important moment. And I think even for music, it was important because that where, that's when Ibaku uh, got his project out and that project as well was massive. So. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it makes me think of this whole uh, idea of like taking risks again, you know, it's just like, you know, putting yourself on the line and uh, and to sort of like rebound on, on, on the question of uh, Amanda, I want to say that like, um, uh, like what binds us as like, you know, this like new generation of like African artists is that like, you know, we sort of like trying to like tell the story from our point of view, but um uh but like we even though yes we we be we'll, we'll be telling that story to foreigners and westerners but before that we're also telling it to uh africans because there's a lot of africans out there that are not necessarily aware of like their cultural heritage how rich it is but even before that we're telling that story to us you know and at least tell me if i'm wrong uh, omar and silly but like on a personal level I know that like, you know, I am part of that generation that was born, like my parents were right at that, the independence of the country. And uh, in some families, they didn't even like speak in the native language to, uh, to the children. So uh, like you kind of like grew up with like half of your heritage or like, you know, your, part of your heritage has been censored, you know, because it's been uh, regarded as uh, not good enough or are not a pristine enough. So there's this journey of going back to uh, uh, claiming your legal right, you know, claiming your legal heritage. And that's how I feel with, with after like, you know, since 2015, uh, I feel like this is what I've gained. You know, I feel like 
uh, today I feel more at home that, than even when I was born, you know, in, in Africa. I feel even more closer to Africa than I was as, a, as, a, as an infant. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I think another, another related uh, thread of questioning is, is then about the city because, um, you know, you were all drawn to it, either back to it after you've gone away or um, through the work you've already been doing, like early in cartoons. So, um, and, and I noticed in Afropedia, there's always these beautiful, vibrant shots of the city, whatever city they're in, and it just makes you fall in love with it and really want to be there. Like they did a really good job of capturing that energy that is so specific to each of those cities. Um, and so I wanted to ask uh, each of you how you see the city in terms of your work or maybe personally as well, and, and whether or not it has informed your process. Uh, and I think Alun, uh, maybe, I think veers away from the city at times, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, I can only create here. I've realized it. I used to fight that, but uh, now I own it. I embrace it. And I think it's, uh, it's a privilege. Uh, my first um, artist in residency, it was in uh, Malaga. That's where I, I had the idea of the um, diaspora series. My first self, my first self portraits. But, you know, I was there for six months, but I had to fly back to Dakar two weeks to shoot the series <laughs> and then go back. I just couldn't. Uh, when it's a commercial uh, project, yeah, I guess I can. I, I happen to do, do commercial work uh, outside. But uh, when it comes to uh, creating, there is this whole thing that people don't see, you know, all these hours you are seemingly watching TV, but you're not even seeing the TV. You're just like cooking things in your head and you're not talking to anybody. <laughs> we all have these weird moments. For me, this can only happen here in Dakar. It's 90% of the creative process and the shooting is, and the retouching is just 10%. And for me, it can only happen in Dakar. It feeds me. Gosh, I love this place. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think... I've been uh, obsessed with my city. When I, when I came back after my, stu my studies, I was born and raised in Dakar. I graduated here, then I went to France to study. I spent, let's say, something like five years abroad and then, and then came back. But when I came back, it was at a specific moment in 2008 when I feel like the creative wave of the city was so loud. And there was this, you know, the, this subculture, uh, alternative scene that was forming, that was getting together. So it was a time where it was just stimulating in all possible ways. So I, uh, studying Dakar came from that point and it just become, it just became a part, some type of constant news that is always in the background of the collections. Um, but now it's, I think it's becoming more than that. It's becoming a true subject of research. And um, the, the thing that makes us so close to our city, besides emotional uh, factors, besides familial factors, there is something that is happening here. And that is, uh, it has a name. And I think it's what, what I try to capture through fashion and through, through film, through writing stories. There's a richness in the way that uh, technology, uh, urban frenzy, uh, heritage, magic, there's, th uh, there's a specific blend that is happening in the city and that is just fascinating. And I think it's important to uh, put it into image so that we remember as, uh, as youth and remember as a country what we have and value it. And be, besides that, it, to put it in competition with what other people say that uh, that we are, but I think the most important today is to uh, refresh the memories of people that live here, and then from that will the perception will will organically changed. Alun, did you want to add anything? And I'm going to go to yeah. audience questions after that. We have so many. All right. Okay, <laughs> I'll be quick then. Um, oh no. I just wanted to say that, like on a personal level, I know that like. Um, what inspire me is uh, the silences, actually. I'm very drawn to silences, but it doesn't mean that like, I have to be in a place that's silent to get inspired. On the contrary, I, I will go to Dakar, which is actually a very vibrant city. 
there's a lot of energy, but even in that, that constant uh, noise and, you know, all this vibration, there's always like spaces where, you know, like time sort of like stands still and it just speaks to you. So I'm always after that, those moments in Dakar and I keep seeing those. It's almost like um, uh, this is a, a funny comparison, but it's like moments like movies, you know, like as if I'm watching a movie every time I'm in Dakar and I'm just like seeing those like epic scenes and they just like tell me, all right, this is your script. Here's your script, you know, in that silence. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I feel you. Excellent. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, so I'm going to move on because we do have a lot of questions coming in. And if it's okay with the three of you, uh, we're going to go a little bit over since we had some technical difficulties and some latecomers. Um, That's fine. Is that okay? All right. Yes, so <laughs> there is a, a question that I think a, a couple of people seconded that I wanted to, to put forward. And it's from, um, if I can say, uh, Natalia or Natalia. Uh, I wanted to pick up on some things you said. Could you all talk some more about memories and immaterial patrimony as the source for the honest or authentic away from stereotypes and ethnographic visions? Uh, she also wants to hear about skin. The screen is skin, the image is skin. Clothes is that which covers our skin. Um, and that uh, skin is being something that mediates in inside and in outside. So I suppose there's two kind of um, ideas there. Culture, a sort of a ephemeral cultural patrimony and then the idea of skin. So I don't know if you, any of you want to pick up on that. Sorry, Amanda, I, I missed the beginning of the question. Oh, sure. on the, what's, what's the question? So I think this person is interested in knowing more about memories and immaterial patrimony uh, okay. as the source for a sort of authentic experience away from stereotypes is what it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would like to to answer on that part. I think last last year, I think it put, no, it was already two years ago. My God, in two thousand and eighteen, the the report African patrimony was uh, uh, released by Felwin Sar and Benedict Savoy, and I think it's um, all the questions and interrogate uh, interrogations and urge to read. The, the eight volumes, I don't know if it's eight or 10, but all the volumes of general history of Africa, just all of those uh, for me was the, um, the expression of a thirst, a thirst of, uh, of uh, scientific knowledge that covers uh, the, the ensemble of the territory and of the continent and just understand better their history besides the ways your family uh, uh, have intervened in the history of the country besides what it, what is told to you by family uh, voices. And why is the patrimony in, important is that you, um, you get to share something via the, um, how can I say it? You, you get to tap into tools uh, ways of life, visions of the world that are not shared because they are supposed to be shared by you who are part of your culture, who comes from your country, and it is, it is not, not done. And the best people to do it are the people who are part of that region of the world. So I think um, going deeper into what we have as uh, Senegalese people, as, uh, as trans-African artists is where our, the most refined part of our contribution to the world, that's where it's hidden. And I think that process, process of research has a double importance. The first important, importance is that it um, reconnects you with what you have. And the second one is that it shows you that you can, uh, that what you have will permeate your art, but it will also I don't know how to say it, but just um, revive a set of tools that you're actually sleeping on. And you, there are so many examples for skincare, healthcare, mental yeah. care. There, there are many, many things that uh, we have and that the transmission stopped at a certain point. And right now going back and studying it, it's asking to the grandparents, whoever, 
I think it's it's an it's the most radical route to take. I like that. Hmm. Do, do either one of you uh, want to? Yeah. Uh, just um, 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 what I want to say is that uh, our African nations are very young. And I think for the last uh, 60 years, I'm talking about the republics and the, the nations, you know, the modern form, uh, the modern forms of uh, African societies, these are relatively young. And uh, I think we've been uh, too focused on growing up as nations. Uh, and we've been a bit, <clears throat> we've been a bit lazy when it comes to remembering who we were and what we can um, use in that heritage um, to grow even faster, you know? And uh, that's what I'm trying to do. That's what uh, I presume uh, what Celi and Alun are doing. We are putting a mirror in front of our people to tell them and remind them that they are great, but this greatness has been here for a while. And there are still so many things that we can get from, I mean, just, just the example of feminism. <clears throat> Feminism, we've been at the forefront of feminism for a while. Hey, we've been in matriarchy for thousands of years. Uh, the Nigerian Igbo women uh, somehow saved their society at some point when they, when they fought back against uh, the new rules of the British uh, rule. There are things that we can get in there that we can use and share with the world. That's, that's what it's about. I don't know if that answers that question, but that's what I believe in, really. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. I think it sure does answer the, the question, and it's, it's exactly what you're saying, uh, Omar. We have to uh, uh, take a, a leap, well, take a look back in order to leap forward properly. And, uh, and I think one thing's for sure is that like today, uh, and, and I think that's where I believe that we win, because no outsider can tell us who we are, because the, the, the mirror has been so well polished over the, the, the past few years that like no one can be like, hey, uh, no, you can't fool me. This is me and I know who I am. I, I've seen myself today. I'm actually seeing myself right now. Mm. So we have a, a lot more other questions coming in. So uh, I think I'm gonna skip that one for now. Uh, so Kelly, uh, Bowen Kelly, uh, to all panelists, the majority of you have created works that could be classified as Afrofuturist. Uh, so what should we keep an eye out for in terms of the next wave of Afrofuturist aesthetic? Uh, and outside of Dakar, which creative hubs would uh, should we be visiting in West Africa? I have my own ideas, but I'll, I'll let you take that. <laughs> I, I know Alun, especially you've, you've, well, all three of you have been talked about as Afrofuturists, so, so you might resist it or, or lean into it. So um, Alun, what about you? Yeah, I know that like, you know, I've, I've been, a lot, of, a lot of people have been saying that like, I'm a, like I've, I've been doing Afrofuturism and, uh, and I know that like on a personal level, when I create my work, especially it was like that series, Edification, the kid with the, the, the VR, um, uh, Google's uh, glasses and um, but like I always felt like that it was extremely contemporary like it's like you would go down to um, a store in Dakar you could buy those Google's easily but it's just that like in the head of people uh, seeing a, an African kid with like modern technology means future and uh, and and um, Going back to that, I think I'm not against it because I feel like every avenue going back to that branding idea, you know, at the end of the day, you want to put that on a shelf. You want people to be caught by something, but the package, that wrap is nothing. You know, what's in, important, it's the inside because once they're in it and if it's like, you know, consistent, then they'll keep like sinking in like and the... Uh, the root will uh, sink into the soil. I know I've used that a few times, but I really see that as like a foundation kind of uh, image. You know, we have to have solid foundations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, regarding Afrofuturism, I think it was, um, I, I leaned in, in the, that genre and I, I 
felt for many years that I was part of that, let's say, visual and aesthetic world. But but today I realized that it was for lack of a better um, expression and a more fine-tuned uh, term of what is happening here when we are curious about the future, when we are in perspective, when we are in speculation. So I think it's, um, I don't know who, who was speaking about laziness, but uh, it's, it's also, yes, it's also, I think, um, part of my job and the job of people such as uh, yourself or Ibaku, j'en sais rien, but part of that to just sit and, and understand exactly what we are saying when we explore time, knowing that in our, in many of our cultures, we don't have the same perception of time as a linear phenomena. And it has that perception of a more circular time has been present for millennia. So I don't know if I am, um, I, I even think that I'm not an Afrofuturist. So I, 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 I really don't feel um, connected to that to that group anymore. And I have a problem with what Alim B is saying, just the juxtapositions of ideas, African technology, boom, it makes, uh, it's a speculation. No, technology has been present in our civilization for ages. So yes, I'm, I think I'm out of the family. I don't know which, uh, which family I will create for myself, but yeah. I think we're saying the same thing, so sorry to interrupt. I think yeah, that sure. like people are not used to see technology in Africa, but it has been there, you know, and it's here right now. And that's why like sometimes they see an image with technology and they immediately think of the future of Africa. No, it's now, okay. it's in the past too, you know, it's um, so it's more like for me, that project was more like a look, more so of a look into the past than actually a leap into the future. But it was a look into the past on how to leap into the future. That's how it was to me, at least when I did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I'll go I, I, I can, no, it's going to be very short uh, as an mm -hmm. answer. You can call my work whatever you want it as, as long as you look at it and try to understand it. I'm not against labels if uh, there are vehicles for understanding. Mm -hmm. um, I, no, really. Um, <laughs> It, it doesn't bother me. I don't consider myself a, uh, uh, an Afrofuturist because maybe I don't even, I don't, I don't know the history of the movement uh, enough. And, um, and also I'm self-taught and I came through the window when I was 30 year old. So I don't really belong to, you know, uh, uh, movements. But um, what matters to me is that you, you go uh, over the labels and, you know, get interested in what I have to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and find some way to relate to it. It doesn't necessarily yeah. matter what you call it, as long as it's mm -hmm. having an impact and making a difference in some way. Yeah. I think all, all of you are, are thinking about that, thinking past those kinds of um, confines. But I think it also, it got popularized because, because of Black Panther, of course. And, know, and yeah. so then people are sort of obsessed with it and trying to find works that they think maybe fit into that category. And I, I don't think it's necessarily top of people's minds or artists' mm. minds when they're, when they're creating that work some, but... Um, so uh, since Omar was just talking, there were a couple questions that came in specifically for you that I wanted to put out there. Um, one wanted to know if you were in influenced by Kehinde Wiley. Uh, yeah, I saw that question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, because of the color, the use of your colorful backgrounds, the other person yeah. asked a similar question about West mm -hmm. African studio portraiture, those sisters there like Seju mm -hmm. Keita, uh, yeah. uh, Malik Sidibe. So, Mama Kase. So I, I, I start with the Kehinde question. I believe it was from Raymond Gonzalez, right? Um, Kehinde is a friend. He's my brother. He's my mentor. He's uh, almost my neighbor. He's everything. But believe it or not, I, uh, it took me a while to realize who Kehinde was. Uh, mm -hmm. Because like it's maybe after a year, uh, a year after the first time we met, because I had him over at my place for lunch. Uh, he was, I was introduced to him uh, through a friend, uh, you know, those emails, hey, I have a friend uh, who's coming to Dakar. Can you, can you guys meet? I said, all right. So we, we were in contact for about a year. I never took the time to really look at his work and know what he was doing until someone 
sent me the photos and I was like, whoa, people are going to think, um, you know, <laughs> um, well, no, but it actually just happened that our works um, in some era, in, in some periods of our career, our works have been very similar. But uh, he's, a, he's a big brother, both in the arts and in life. And uh, I owe him a lot in terms of, uh, you know, navigating this world that is still new to me. So, yeah. And for, for those of you don't, that don't know, Kehinde Wiley has uh, an artist studio project in Dakar called Black Rock. Uh, and that it's specifically geared towards uh, people outside of Africa coming and doing studio residencies on the continent because there aren't just frankly aren't enough of those in existence. And so he really wanted to chip away at that. And I know that of the artists that have been there so far, a lot of them have been American and just have had so little exposure to the amazing creativity happening on the continent. And so they spend the time, you know, in Dakar meeting people like Omar and having that influence their practice. Um, and broadening their perspective. So I think it's what he's doing there is, is really important. So I wanted to it interject uh, about that project. So please look into it um, if you have a chance. So let's see, another question would be, uh, what is the one thing you'd like your arts to contribute uh, changing in Africa or in the world? And if you could summarize the message of your art in one sentence, what would it be? That's, that's a tough one. So, um, it would be one sentence for me. Uh, it would be, quote, unquote, you, you, are, you are a part of it. You are a part of it. That's what I would say to my fellow Africans. You're part of this history that we're still writing. You're a big part of it. Don't let anybody um, uh, you know, tell you that the world is happening elsewhere and that you're just at in, on the outskirts. You are at, this, at the center, just like everyone. And to the other non-African people, I would show our past and tell them you are a part of it. You know, uh, this legacy of slavery, all the hardship we have gone through, we need to share it. If we don't share it, we cannot share a future. Everybody has to um, acknowledge it. It's not about taking responsibility, taking ownership. All the perpetrators are not here anymore, but it needs to be acknowledged. And then we can have a positive look at the future. So we are all part of it, it being the past and the future and now. But yeah. I think Alun said something similar um, last time I spoke where that, that history of uh, the transatlantic slave trade, all of that, that bulky history is, is traumatic, yes, but it's not an open bleeding wound anymore, it's a scar. Uh, for, for those of you practicing today. And, and that's really mm -hmm. stuck with me is, is just something to think about in terms of what is being done now by these younger mm -hmm. generations of, of artists mm -hmm. like you. So uh, Alun, do you have maybe one sentence to, uh, that you would say? Uh, I, I would like to say that like, um, you know, what we do as artists is uh, we take impressions and turn them into a expression, you know, we take like, um, um like a feeling and uh we we trying to like descend it into like the, the material world but as we do that uh and it goes back to what omar was saying earlier that it's our way it's it's a mirror it's a it's it's a way for culture to sort of like uh describe itself through culture so as you describe yourself just be true, be you. Don't try to like, see like, uh, we, it seems like me, Sally and Omar, we all have like somewhat, you know, very similar messages, but then we express it in so, such like a different way, you know, we, we like in different universes, but yet we sing the same thing, but it's because like, you know, we have our own voices. Uh, and I think that's important of like, not trying to copy someone else, just like, express what you feel right there you know that's uh, that's how i would sum it up mm -hmm. Sally, do you want to yeah i would echo what what uh, both of you said i think uh, it's very important to stress that out that we are all part of it and now more than ever we are uh we are obliged to to um to be a part of the same world and we cannot strip yourself or protect yourself of anything that is happening at the other uh, side of the globe. So I think more than ever, it's 
uh, important to share who we are and to make sure that we connect with uh, with the whole of humanity. And I think this crisis has shown as well that uh, the continent of Africa was not just um, at the periphery of what is happening in the world. And uh, it, it was good for, for the, the African countries as well to realize what they have as strategic advantages and to know that today what is I think what is awaited from us as artists is to just contribute into the archaeology and into the digging up and presenting to the world what we what we have to contribute really and um, that contribution is important it uh, saves it saves lives because it, it saves the lives of people that practice that art but it touches people and it opens up some channels channels of communication that maybe policy cannot attain and maybe economics have uh, difficulties touching so we are part as artists of that complex matrix of having sounder and better relationships with uh, uh, with each other mm -hmm. <laughs> where was that at it, it wasn't me <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what's happening? Like, that was a punchline, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. You did good. <laughs> uh, so, Lisa McDonald had a question I thought was good because um, in about a week we should have all been together in Dakar for yeah. Dakar for the for the oh, biennial that yes. has now been uh, postponed. I think maybe for two years until the next one. So, um, it usually takes a place every year. Dakar. So um, does it provide a good exposure to what is occurring? Or do you all think that there's a better event to get a glimpse of the art scene in Dakar? Because there are numerous other ones that happen. So do you think that Dakar is representative or do you have other recommendations? That's a quick one. Dakar is, uh, Dakar is the bomb. You know? <laughs> <I think. laughs> it's really good. I think um, what I love about Dakar is the, the, the banal is that, uh, like every time I, I've been to like the, the Dakar, I always felt like I, I could have been anywhere in this world because it was so international. And I think it goes back to what Omar was saying. Like, you know, I, I remember being at that train station in 2016 with like DJs from South Africa and DJs from New York, but then all these people from all over the world and just like being really confused of like, am I in, am I in Tokyo? Am I in Sydney? I, I, I was confused, but it felt good. It was a good confusion. So I love that card in that sense, you know, it's, uh, it's global. Um, there is the, the parcours, which is, uh, it's like um, an association of all the galleries in Dakar. Every December, I believe, they have a, a sort of 15 day circuit with openings, uh, new openings every day. And uh, it's mostly local artists, but it's very good art because I think what makes what makes it uh, stand out is because there is far less pressure than uh, the Biennale. The Dakar mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, for many artists who have less um, international exposure, it's one chance every 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 other year to show the world what you do. So that comes with a lot of pressure, and pressure is not good for creativity anyway, and it's not good for um, it, it becomes it becomes more event management and planning than an artist That's opening. True. You know what I mean? And uh, for, for um, uh, Le Parcours, there are much uh, smaller budgets, much smaller places, people have time. Uh, the setting is uh, always like after work, people linger. And uh, I, I really love the, the, the Parcours. It's every December, right, you guys? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is uh, yeah, each year. Yeah, yeah, I really like it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a bit of a, a not a party atmosphere, but certainly it, it's um, congenial and casual and fun. And you're just talking to a lot of neat people and wandering to different openings. Yeah. And yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's good. Uh, Sally, do you want to add anything? Or No, I, I have the parcours in mind as well. I think those are the both uh, most important events in Dakar for contemporary arts and for studios, artist studios. I think the parcours, though, is more... Is, there's a bit more intimacy and there's a bit, you know, something that a bit more conviviality. The Biennale is really massive. Huh? It's like, it is huge. I don't know what the metrics are for the in, but for the off, it's a lot. 
Yeah, what it's was about it like? it's about two hundred and fifty, I think, the last time I checked. Wow. E exhibitions. Yeah. A lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> maybe given our current circumstances, things like parkour will will um, be more imperative and and maybe mm. get more a little bit more attention, but hopefully not blow up to the the status of that car, right? Because yeah. Yeah, just thinking. Yes, about I think both both are important for for different reason. But what is cool with the parkour is that it happens every every year. Mm -hmm. So each year there's an event that is gradually, you know, taking a, an important space. Then and even artists from other countries from West Africa come and exhibit during the parkour. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity as well to to meet buyers and to have something mm -hmm. that is, you know, a qualitative event that happens every year and where you can where you can sell actually. Mm -hmm. I like that there's also a representation of a lot of African galleries as opposed to American mm -hmm. or European ones. And I think that's really important because there's so many yeah. great galleries on the continent and they tend to not get as much exposure in, in Western countries. So I found that to be um, encouraging. So we have two kind of similar questions and I know we're, we're sort of running out of time. We still have so many, but um, Ashley Evans wanted to know uh, about what you think is the most important social media platform and do you think it's better to post daily to generate content or do you more thoughtfully post and make sure that each one is, uh, however rare, treated carefully? So there's that kind of a uh, question about generating content for social media and how often. And then Joseph Underwood wanted to know, uh, how do you reconcile the lack of official education in photography or video in Senegal with the current popularity of those art forms in contemporary art and social media? They're kind of related questions, so I don't know. Mm -hmm softball to somebody um as, as for the social media i love instagram i love the gram um because it's, I, love <laughs> I love the gram <laughs> because um, um you make it whatever you want to make it uh more so than you know facebook or uh, the others that i don't even know um uh, and also um about the question how to uh, about post Sting, it's not about um, how often you post. I can stay eight weeks without posting anything, but always make sure you have a story to tell. If you don't have anything to say, uh, you can post a random image and a hashtag, it's okay. But um, don't post because you have to. Don't post on the schedule. Nobody wants that, not even you, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> and it's about sharing. Uh, make it personal but don't but uh not too much you know you have to protect your identity and your privacy but um feel like you know you're throwing something into somebody's window so make it look good uh throw somebody that you know throw something that adds uh at least joy or inspiration or something mm -hmm. but you know don't post on a schedule mm -hmm. it's either one of Sally or Lou. Um, I'll, I'll echo what Omar says. I mean, I, um, social media, I think my, my favorite platform is as well Instagram for obvious reasons. And uh, I, um, I'm not a fan of all the apps that make you schedule your posts. Um, I think there's, um, there's a lack of, um, there's something that you lose uh doing that there's a type of spontaneity something organic that you lose when you plan what you're about to share with people that follow you and um i believe um i'm not a huge poster as well i'm not uh overtly present in, on social media because i i think i have a complicated relationship with social media but i mean <laughs> <laughs> this is Business-wise and creatively, I I just realized that it's important to share the your work process for people that want to, you know, on back on that journey. And for those people, I think I've been posting much more. So um, I forgot what the original question was, but uh, <laughs> definitely Instagram and uh, definitely storytelling, having something meaningful to share with people and. Uh, and, and yes, I could, I, that's, that's how I do it. So I think, totally uh, agree. yeah, we're, <laughs> we're running a little short of time and, and I think people, all of us have other, other places to be everyone. But uh, I think this, this would be a good last question because it's, it's, 
thinks about aspirations and aspirational endeavors. So what have you done or what do you aspire to do that would mark your realization of your goals as an artist? So what is your dream exhibition, fashion venue, et cetera? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think that like, you know, the, to dream, I mean, the dream of being on a journey and accomplishing like bigger things, you know, I, I, at least right now keeps unfolding and it's great, but I really feel like the greatest thing that I could do as an artist, it's to, it's to give back what I've received actually. So a lot of like right now, a lot of like my personal like thinking as an artist, it's like, you know, how do, it actually started with you, um, Amanda, because I used to go to, uh, to North Carolina and do like some workshops their photography workshops and um, and as I was doing it, people would ask me, uh, hey, you know, how come you're not doing that in Senegal? And it's true, we don't have any photography school. Uh, so I think this is a great time to actually think of like, because it was a struggle for us. Uh, I'm like, I'm talking on a personal level. I didn't know anything about like uh, how to make a certificate of authenticity. How many prints do you do? Like, I mean, there's so many rules out there and if it wasn't for people that actually are kind enough to share them with you, you, you lost. So there's like codes and like, you know, um, things that you have to know. And I want to pass them along at this, at this point. This is where I'm at. You know, that would be my greatest achievement. Mm -hmm. If I don't get to that, uh, it's like I would fail, I think. Yeah, I, I, do know, I think, yeah, that's exactly... Um, if I want to be, yeah, if I were to be remembered for something, I hope that it would include me um, uh, helping, uh, I mean, showing the mirror to younger artists and tell them and show them how much potential they have and help them realize that potential because that was given to me. You know, uh, somebody had to look at my photos and say, what are you going to do with these? Because I didn't know. I, I, I didn't even want to post them on, on my Facebook. I, I, I hope that to somebody I'm going to be what Kehinde has been to me when I completed Diaspora. And he was the first one to look at them. And uh, he told me, you need to put these out. You're not keeping them, right? If it wasn't for him, I never would have shown them. Like, these were selfies for me, you know, and really? I want to have that impact too. Yeah, really, wow. it's, it's Kehinde. Yeah. My God. Yeah. But, but why weren't you going to show it? It was an experiment for me. And I shot this series because I had no model around. Uh, you know, so I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to wear, I'm going to wrap myself into clothes and trying to look like this image because I really love it. And I see myself in this guy and everything. That's the beginning of the story. Mm -hmm. So uh, you need that voice that is reassuring, but that, you know, tells you the truth. If, if it was bad, he would have told me too, you know, and I want to play that role too. I love that series that you're you're amplifying the histories of, of these amazing heroes, these characters that we've had over um, however many years, and and I love that project because you know you're stepping into that role, so there is a mirror there for you as well in some ways. But you're also really showing that history to people that that I just don't think we get that kind of information, especially here in no. America. We don't know who those people are. I mean, I I do because yeah. it's part of my job, but so many other people don't. And it reminds me just briefly of a, a show on at the Smithsonian right now about heroes. And I mm -hmm. love thinking about those people throughout history that should be our heroes, that should be remembered. Yeah. And I, I think of all of you as, as becoming our heroes right now yeah. as well. You know, yeah. you're creating yeah. Yeah. a yeah. really exciting future for all of us. And you're, you're mm -hmm. look, making us look more deeply about. <laughs> um, and then Sally, I don't know if you had um, something else to add to, to that question. Yes, I think it's it's uh, the same preoccupation of uh, giving back, of sharing, of making sure that through your art you are useful to your community. Because I think it's um, it's it's important. It is needed, and there are no. I think we are we are the generation when being an artist uh, becomes, you know, f understandable as a, as an economical model for families or for the country and the, the the careers artistic and 
designer careers are more valorized right now, but still there is um, still a bit of a mystery as to how you make it in such industries. And I think more and more youth are looking for templates to see when you're a fashion designer in Dakar, how you can push your work forward, how you can share your universe, uh, have a solid enough voice to make it a brand. So all of that are part of reflections um, on my end onto how do we give back, how to create a toolkit so that um, people can make a living out of their art. And that's, that's, uh, that's important. I think being in a collective serves that purpose um, integrating people into that collective serve that purpose and just being in the in the, um, in in deepening the study without within our field serve as well that purpose because your your voice gets clearer and and more refined. So uh, yeah, it gravitates basically to the around the the notion of giving back, but in the in the best way possible. Agreed. So uh, yeah, I think that unless you have something else to add, Alun looks like you're going to say. No, no, no. I was just. Um, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I think the glass is empty. Yes. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Last drop. You know. <laughs> um, I I have so enjoyed talking to the three of you today. I really appreciate you and, and what you do so much, and it's been an absolute pleasure to share. Um, your viewpoints and what you're doing with um, more people in, in our community, a global community. Um, I, uh, Maria, who has been uh, hosting this, I'd like to thank her and to thank Luke at the NCMA for helping us organize this event. Uh, Maria has posted all the information for all three of your Instagram and Facebook so that you can be followed and contacted. Um, and then I also wanted to offer my email address if there's any future questions. There are so many, and there was one actually directed at me that I, I didn't have a chance to get to. So feel free to email me with any other questions that you might have um, about the event or that I can answer. Um, so Maria, if you could put that up, um, that would be great. Uh, any for, final thoughts from any of you before we, we head off? Uh, well, I hope I to like see to you guys see soon. soon. <laughs> like for real. Gonna... IRL? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say one thing that I actually saw on uh, the Afripedia, the New York uh, video. Uh, like at some point, they say creativity has the power to influence, you know, so don't take that for granted. You know, like an artist don't need talent, they need audacity more, you know, they need more audacity than talent. Yeah. <laughs> Be brave. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so Thank much. You so Thank, much you. Guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Maya. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Bye. Bye. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. 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 A bientôt. A bientôt. Au revoir. Au revoir.